I want to thank you for your outpouring of love uh, during my wife's transition. Some 50 plus preachers came from across this brotherhood and showed their love and encouragement to me. And I want you to know I am forever grateful and indebted to you for your demonstration of love. I had a picture taken with all of these preachers and uh, someone took a panoramic view and I had it run off at Staples and I have it on my wall in the office. And I saw people on the picture that I didn't even know who were there. Ain't God good? I love preachers, amen, and I've encouraged a lot of preachers in my lifetime. I feel good. My attitude is good. Help me, Lord Jesus, and I, I, I don't have it in for nobody. I'm trying to set the record straight. Because, you know, sometimes when tough love is demonstrated, uh, folk can't argue with the facts, so they get personal. But my heart is right. My spirit is right. And the book is right. If you don't mind... I want to read just a verse from the Bible. We've been here a long time, so I won't read all these verses. You scholars know it already. Hebrews. I don't be asking for Shebrews. It's only Hebrews. This ain't no total equality of scripture in here is Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with the reverence and godly fear. Amen to the word of God. The book of Hebrews has been called by some the fifth gospel. The four gospels describe Christ's ministry on earth. But this one describes his ministry in heaven at the right hand of God. The glories of our loving Savior or exhibited in this great book. And our eyes are fixed upon Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12 and 2. He is set before us, crowned with glory and honor, Hebrews 2 and 9. And this book was written to discourage Christians who were wavering in their faith, suffering persecution, 
and the worst was about to come. And the inspired writer wanted to keep them from drifting back into Judaism. And the writer's fundamental argument is the superiority of Jesus Christ over everybody else. John 3 and 31, he that cometh from above is above all. There is nobody greater than Jesus. In God's hall of heroes to solidify our faith by giving us a panoramic view of the history of Israel, there's nobody greater than Jesus. Abel worship by faith, but Jesus is greater. Enoch walked with God, but Jesus is greater. Noah built the ark, but Jesus is greater. Abraham lived by faith, but Jesus is greater. Moses governed by faith, but Jesus is greater. Joshua fought the battle by faith, and Daniel subdued kingdom by faith, but Jesus is greater. And from this contextual backdrop, I like to talk about uh, some unshakable things in shaky time. Now don't push me now. I, I, I want to talk about some unshakable things in shaky times. With Donald make America great again, Trump in the White House, things are shaken from your house to the White House. Major cosmoclitic changes are impacting every area of our lives. The family is shaky. Audacious adultery, flaunting fornication, open marriage, gay marriage, shaking up, have radically changed our views on the family. We're living in shaky times. Health can be shaken. And we see the decline and the disappearance of our loved ones. Prosperity can be shaken. Economic shockwaves have closed businesses that were 50 or 60 years old. Sears is standing on shaky ground right now. 54 years after the civil rights legislation of 1964, our young black men are still an endangered species by police brutality. Still can't sit down in Starbucks and wait for a friend without being arrested. Jesus, I need a little help in here. Things are shaky. And our young ladies and, and middle-aged ladies are having problems. Help me, somebody. Uh, Jesus, I need some help in here. Uh, the, the Me Too movement. I hope we don't have one <laughs> in the church. I 
I ain't after nobody. I just hope we don't have one in the church. But the question is, is there anything that cannot be shaken? I'd like to suggest just two. Number one, the isness of God cannot be shaken. God is, not was, God is, not shall be, God is, not used to be, God is. God is the strength of my life. God is an awesome God. And I believe that he is standing by me right now. He said, I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. And I believe there is no temptation taken you but such as come unto man. But God is faithful. Is there anybody in here? that knows God is faithful. I said, is there anybody in here that knows God is faithful? Have you ever been through something and the Lord brought you through? Have you ever had a situation and you didn't know how you're going to get out? God is faithful. And I'm going to trust in the Lord until I die. God is faithful. He'll never allow you to be suffered with a temptation greater than you're able to bear, but with every temptation, make a way of escape. Yes, I believe that. Yes, God is. His kingdom. cannot be shaken. Help me, help me, Lord Jesus. His kingdom cannot be shaken. Can I say the church of Christ? Is it, is it, is it all right? Do I have to whisper? Help me, Lord Jesus. Can I say church of Christ? In the house. I know we're in the Sheraton Hotel, full star. But is it all right to say that the church of Christ cannot be shaken? I want to say to some change agents that you cannot destroy the church of Christ. I love the church of Christ. I've been a member now for 67 years. I've been preaching for 63 years. Preaching at the same church for 52 years. Husband of one wife for 53 years. And, and I, I'm not going to change what I believe. Jesus, I need some help in here. I'm seeing some disturbing trends in the churches of Christ. I, I'm seeing some disturbing trends. But I want you change agents to understand that this is the Lord's kingdom. This is the Lord's church. And Daniel said, this kingdom cannot be destroyed. It shall stand forever. Some of us 
who have been in the Church of Christ for a goodly number of years recognize that it's not the same as it used to be. Some of us are practicing what we used to fight against. Jesus, help me, because there is turbulence in what I'm fixing to say. We used to preach against calling the preacher pastor. But now some of our preachers are called pastor. And not only pastor, but senior pastor. But in Ephesians 4 and 11, when Paul mentioned the officers of the church, the evangelists were different officers from the pastors. So I asked some scholars in the church, did Paul know what he was talking about? The Bible makes a distinction between the evangelists and the elders of the church. Pastor refers to one of the elders of the church. And unless a man is a minister and an elder scripturally as an officer of the church, he ought not be called pastor. I ain't looking at nobody, so you're going to think I'm after you. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just preaching the word. I don't know how much time I have, Claude Cecil. I may not live as long as you, but as still as, as long as I have health and strength, clothed in my right mind, I got to tell you what the Bible says. There is a trend that's moving in the churches of Christ. We want to be like other churches. When you look up the word pastor in the dictionary, in a denominational sense, it means the preacher in charge of a congregation. And when you say that in the denominational world, that's an extreme term. Some people ask me who are not Christians, do you know, who are you? I said, I'm a minister. That's not enough. <laughs> they want to know, are you the pastor? Help me, Lord Jesus. Are you the pastor? I, I said, I'm the minister. I'm not the pastor. But if I said pastor, I would receive more honor among those who are not Christians. Now, you can talk about other definition of the word pastor and what have you, but I only find it one time in the King James Bible, and that's Ephesians 4.11. It's mentioned several times in the Old Testament, but you're not talking about that. Help me, Lord Jesus. We are New Testament ministers. This is the trend, y'all. Watch me. We used to preach against having choirs in the worship service of the church. But now some congregation have praise teams. Chris, I'm not bothering you. 
And Brother Mayfield, I ain't bothering you. All right. But I believe that the scripture teaches that every member of the church ought to praise God with the fruit of his lips. Just like nobody can do your uh, uh, communion for you or give for you, can't nobody sing for you. Say amen if you can. Help me, Lord Jesus. I went to a church of Christ. And I thought I was in the right place. Until I saw the praise team. And you know, I give anybody the benefit of the doubt. So I stayed around to see if this was a mental illusion. <laughs> Help me, Lord Jesus. But they didn't stop. And you know, they started passing the communion and I couldn't take it. Because I knew my worship would not be accepted. And you know, I tried to sneak out. I, I just tried to, you know, just walk out without anybody seeing me leave. But I had to leave before service was over. Because I don't believe in somebody else praising God for me. We are drifting. Whew. Another trend. We used to preach that congregations should be identified like they were in the Bible. I know some of y'all not going to like me, but I'm 80 years old and it really doesn't matter whether you like me. I ain't got long to stay here. We used to preach that congregation should be identified like they were in the Bible by location unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, unto the churches of Galatia, Galatians 1 and 2, unto the church of the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1. And Jen, John wrote, in Revelation 1 and 4, to the seven churches of Asia. The church of Ephesus, Revelation 2, 1. Church in Smyrna, Revelation 2, 8. Church in Pergamos, Revelation 2, 12. Church in Thyatira, Revelation 2, 18. Church in Sardis, Revelation 3 and 1. Church in Philadelphia, not PA. Church in Philadelphia, 3 and 7. Church of the Laodicean, 3, 14. Help me, somebody. Location. I saw on the internet the New Horizon Church of Christ. I saw on the internet Grace View Church of Christ. That's not location. Light of the world, Church of Christ. Hope, Church of Christ. Bold believers, Church of Christ. That's not location. 
I didn't get one amen from you. Y'all must be scared. Y'all must be scared. I ain't scared of nobody. That's not according to location. I said we are drifting. We are slipping. We're falling gradually. And some years later, we're going to find out that we got a monster. And Jeff and Lavelle, y'all going to have to deal with it. Because I'll be gone, Washington gone. Help me, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I've been up here 29, 28 minutes and 41 seconds. Am I supposed to extend the invitation? I thought so. I, I, I'm, I'm getting my landing gear together. I, I, I love young preachers. But I'm not trying to be like any mega church. This is the beginning of watering down the doctrine. And we begin to water down this and we water down that. And before you know it, it will not be the church of Christ. After a while, we're going to have women preachers in the churches of Christ. Help me, Lord Jesus. We used to preach the one Lord, the one faith, the one church, the one baptism, the one hope of your calling, and the one God. But let me, let me sound my trumpet. It is hard to distinguish some gospel preachers from denominational preachers. I think I said something. Can I say it again? Today, it's difficult to distinguish a gospel preacher from a denominational preacher. And that's a shame. I don't mean we have to be mean and ugly and unkind. We have to preach the truth in love. We have all kind of ministries in our congregation, but we preach the gospel. Amen and amen. Doctrine is watered down. Nothing but silence. Very few evangelistic sermons. Whew. Very few denominations, uh, uh, very few uh, evangelistic sermons. Don't give the plan of salvation. Even Joel Austin gives a plan. And Joel Austin doesn't believe anything. But when he closes a sermon on television, he says, if anybody wants to be saved, repeat after me the sinner's prayer. At least he tells them something. If a sinner wants to know the plan of salvation from some of our preachers, he has to get it the best way he can because they're not going to tell him. I said in my intro, I love everybody. My spirit is right. I ain't got no animosity in my heart. I love the church of Christ. But I see some dangers ahead. And I'm saying to the change agents, you cannot destroy the church of Christ. No distinction between the church of Christ and denominational churches.
And now some are having Easter Sunday services. <laughs> Y'all gonna make me stay off of internet. That's how I know a lot of this stuff. <laughs> Can I preach a little while in here? Yeah, we got Easter Resurrection Sunday now. But I still believe that the Resurrection Sunday is every Sunday. We take the Lord's Supper every Sunday and this mal emphasis upon Easter Sunday is not New Testament oriented doctrine. We mislead folk. Lead them astray. And I'm saying to our preachers, to our church leaders, stay with the Bible. Because we belong to an unshakable kingdom. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm going to stay in the church of Christ. It's Holy Spirit filled. It's hell proof. It's heaven bound. I'm going to stay in the church of Christ. And when I come to the end of my journey on planet earth, someday I'm going to fly away to a home on God's so last the shore. And when I stand before Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, my protector, my provider, my way maker, my door opener, my joy that cometh in the morning, I want to hear him say, well done, the good and faithful servant. And when them pearly gates swing open and when the saints go marching in, I don't have to be the first one in the number, but I want to be in the number. I want to be somewhere in the number. And one of these old days, I'm going to lay my burdens down, down by the riverside. And I ain't going to study war no more. Home at last. Thank God Almighty, I made it home at last. Church of Christ is right. I invite you to become a member of the Church of Christ. It's distinctively different. And it's the only church you can read about in the Bible. How does a man get in it? You can't raise your hand and get in it. You can't pray your way in it. You can't moan your way in it, but you got to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You got to hear what Jesus did for you. And can't nobody outdo what Jesus has done for us. He hung, bled, and died. But God raised him up from the dead never to die anymore. Amen and amen. And you got to believe that with all of your heart. Hebrews uh, 11 and 6, you got to believe in him without faith. It's impossible to please God. He that come after God must believe that he is. Except you believe in him, he you'll die in your sins. It's not Dr. Oz. It's not Dr. Phil. You can't fix it. It's not Sister Oprah. But it's Jesus. It's not Confucius. It's not Buddha. But it's Jesus. I am the way. Truth and the life. And nobody can come to the Father but by me. And then you repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Change your mind about what is wrong. 
and accept what the Bible says about sin. Even though America has redefined sin, two men can get married and no sin according to the law. Y'all getting quiet? Repent. Make that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Acts 8.37. And then you're baptized in water for what? For the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. To wash your sins away, Acts 22.16. And when you rise from the dripping waters of baptism, put your hands in the hands of the man that still the water and let that man be your bridge over troubled water. And child, he'll bless you like you have never been blessed in all of your life. He'll open doors for you. He'll make a way out of no way for you. you step in your sick room. And when you go to the cemetery to leave your loved one there, you don't go alone. Because he said, I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you.